Good morning, C2 family. How are we doing this morning? All right, you're here. Welcome, online family. Thanks for joining us this morning. Aaron, it's good to have you online, and the Statlers, we're glad you're joining with us as well. So good morning to you. Church, let's give our online family a warm welcome this morning. We're glad you're with us. We're continuing our series called Conspiracy. For God so loved the world, there's this conspiracy of love that we're trying to dive into. And, and a conspiracy, we kind of think of this unknown, uh, maybe things we can't relate to. We haven't figured it out yet. But hopefully as we take a journey through the gospel of John, uh, we'll see the truth about who Jesus is. The gospel of John really has been summed up by many theologians as just Jesus. It's just Jesus. There's not a lot of fluff. As we get into it, you'll see that John is really just about revealing who Jesus is and really focuses on uh, those things that Jesus said. So if you missed us uh, the last couple weeks, as Megan said, you can get the podcast online, c2church.com, and go to our YouTube page as well and watch those videos. But week one, we talked about through Jesus, God reveals himself to us, that Jesus is the revelation of God to man. And John calls him the word, the logos, the revelation of God to man. Then last week, we talked about grace and truth are personal because of Jesus. This grace and truth that was known through the written word of God is now revealed through the person of God in Jesus Christ. So this is the conspiracy we're diving into today. And the Apostle John, who is the writer of the book of John, is now referencing and has referenced us several times John the Baptist. So we want to make, sh- make clear that these are two separate people. So when John refers to John, John is not referring to himself as John. He's referring to John the Baptist. Does that make sense? Vaguely? <laughs> All right. Well, we'll make it clear as we go. And so John does not refer to himself as John. So anytime he mentions John, he's not referring to himself. He's referring to John, this, John the Baptist. And, and he, John the Baptist is a major player in the gospel. Other than Jesus Christ himself, John is a major player in the prophetic coming of the Messiah and the announcement of Jesus Christ. They are. But here's John the Baptist. He's living off grid. He's living in obscurity, preaching and baptizing what we know now as the far side of the Jordan, the other side of the Jordan from where Jerusalem is located. John the Baptist is not looking for recognition. He's not looking for fame. If he were alive today, he wouldn't have a Facebook, an Instagram, or a TikTok. He would not make videos saying, hey, check out my camel skin coat, right? Check out my latest recipe with honey and locusts. Uh, Check out my uh, my new dance that I made up in the desert. Uh, he He didn't do that. But in his obscurity, John the Baptist was secure in who he was and what he was called to do, what God had called him to do. And here's the sticky thought for today. I want you to write it down. If you got your notebooks on your your phone or something, write it down, type it in. Our purpose is revealed in the revelation of Jesus. Our purpose is revealed in the revelation of Jesus. Now we're jumping back into the first chapter of John. We're going to pick it up in verse 19. So if you have your Bible, open it up and turn it on. In John chapter... One, the Apostle John is now introducing us officially to John the Baptist. And so he says this in verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. In verse 25, they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptized with water. But among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. 
Let's pray. Father, would you reveal yourself to us through your scripture, through the person of Jesus today? Open our minds to discern what you're saying to us. It's in that name of Jesus that I ask. Amen. So here is the Apostle John recording John's testimony about himself and what has occurred. Now, a couple things that we're trying to figure out, you may be trying to figure out, how does the Apostle John know what John is saying? Well, the Apostle John was one of John the Baptist's followers. Before the Apostle John was a disciple of Jesus, he was a disciple of John. He was following John. So it's very likely that he was actually at many of these events. With his close relationship with John the Baptizer, John uh, John the Apostle was able to ask him, hey, what did you think about this? What what happened here? What was that conversation like? So there was an intimacy, and that's how he knows what to record. And so as we dive into this this passage, there's an interesting phrase that kind of needs some examination. He says that the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem. So who are the Jews? Because this is kind of confusing for some people. Why does John use that term in his writings? Because you'll see this throughout the writings of John. Many see it as almost like a derogatory, uh, uh, pejorative term that's polemic, that he's anti-Semitic, that he's actually setting the Jews as opposed to the disciples and the work of Jesus. But that doesn't make sense because John... The Baptist, the Apostle John, all of the disciples, and Jesus himself are Jews. So that logically doesn't make sense. Many have taken those phrases that John says when he says the Jews as uh, replacement theology and supersessionism and, ah, see, the Jews are bad and Jesus is good and, and this, there's this fight. So is John anti-Jewish? Well, that doesn't seem to make sense. He is a Jew. The scholar David Stern suggests that we translate the the term uh, that is used in Greek for Jews is actually better better translated Judeans. Judeans were Jews from the area of Roman territory called Judea under the political authority of Pontius Pilate, who we'll see later in the story. In that sense, the term Judeans is is set against uh, the Jews of Galilee or of Perea and That's where Jesus and his disciples were from. They're from the area of Galilee, not Judea. Now, the Galilean Jews were also Jews, but they were not Judean Jews. And so what John is setting up here is not a fight against Jesus and his disciples and the Jews. What he's actually referring to, most likely, as he points out, the Jews sent priests and Levites. He's actually saying that the 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 religious ruling leaders from Jerusalem sent representatives of their own party, the priests and the Levites, to investigate. So that's a better understanding, that the temple leaders in Jerusalem are the Jews that John is referring to, and they are sending representatives to check out John the Baptist. And we see the idea, the, the term Pharisees appear in verse 24. So it's most likely that this is who is being sent. Now, let's discuss the Pharisees just for a second, because if you grew up in church like me, the Pharisees was a term you use for people who follow the rules too closely. Oh, you're just a Pharisee. (laughs) And it's a term we might use for hypocrites in the church. Well, they, they know the Bible, but they don't actually live it. They're a Pharisee. So we use this term as sort of a gotcha, as an insult uh, to other Christians because, well, the Pharisees in the Bible seem to be all bad guys, right? Set, set against the good guys that are the disciples. And yet if, if you read in the his, his, historical books, like Josephus, Josephus says that, that the Pharisees were actually well-liked amongst the common people, that they weren't all hypocrites and legalists like that we might think of. If you want to think of a Pharisee, think of Nicodemus in, in the, the scriptures, in, in the gospels. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and yet he longed to know the truth about who Jesus is. Or think of Joseph of Arimathea, if you know the story of Christ's burial. It was Joseph of Arimathea. He was a ruler in the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee, who gave Jesus his tomb. 
Not all Pharisees were the hypocrites and legalists that we think of, but they were certainly zealous for the law and trying to help people obey the law of Moses. And so they went overboard at times and it became a burden to people. And so I think that's where we attach our sense of, of legalism and hip, hypocrisy. And Jesus even talks to them. When, when Jesus is mad, who's he mad at usually? The Pharisees. That's who he's, he's talking to. But they were esteemed by the common people and they were known for their careful uh, exploration and explanations of the scriptures. And unlike their opponents, anybody know the opponents of the Pharisees? Like if this was Monday Night Football, it'd be the Pharisees against the Sadducees. That's right. On Monday Night Football, that's who it would be. The Sadduc- unlike the Sadducees, the Pharisees believed in free will. They believed in the survival of the soul, so etern- the eternality of the soul. They believed in the resurrection of the dead and the reward and punishment after death. They believed in the coming Messiah and the coming kingdom of Messiah. So we actually have a lot in common in our theology with the Pharisees. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. So why were they investigating John the Baptist? Were they concerned about losing control? Were they out there to just instigate problems? Well, that might be part of it. But it's more likely, knowing their theology, that they were actually investigating John because of what they were hearing. They were hearing things. People were telling them things about John the Baptist. And being the good Pharisees, the religious rulers that they were, anybody with the size of crowd that John had now following him, they would investigate. Because they were looking for the Messiah. They were, they were anticipating the Messiah. This is, this is the great part about Many of these Jews who came to investigate John, they were actually expecting the Messiah. There might have been an air of excitement that this might be the one that was promised ages ago. They had this expectation. You could say that, that these rulers were sent to do a fact check. Anybody, everybody know what a fact check is, right? It's basically whatever you already believe. If it agrees with that, then you fact checked it. The religious rulers came to fact check the claims because... What was going on behind the scenes was probably that word was getting around of all the people going to see this crazy man out in the desert, right? Here is John the Baptist. If you don't know John the Baptist, you have to read the other Gospels actually to really understand who he is because the Gospels of Matthew and Mark set him up as kind of this crazy guy who's living in the wilderness. He's eating locusts and honey. He's wearing camel skins. He, this is who John the Baptist is. And so they came to fact check the claims that some were saying that he was somebody else. They wanted to know who John claimed to be. So they were coming to check him out. And so this is what sets up the questions, the interview, the interrogation that we see happening here in this passage. The Pharisees, the the legal scholars have come to interview John the Baptist. Who are you? And there's a number of things that I want us, there's three things actually I want us to see today in John's response, in John's testimony. First, John tells us who he is not. John tells us who he is not. And John is this crazy guy in the desert, right? He's wearing these funky clothes. People are coming to him. If you understand what, what we see in the other gospels in Matthew and Mark, John's life parallels Jesus, his divine or miraculous birth, divine intervention for a, a woman who was, who was uh, childless, could not bear children. Suddenly there's this miracle that happens and John is born. There's an angelic proclamation of who John is going to be. Yet John did not believe this was his claim to fame, he knew he had a greater, pers- a greater purpose than personal fame. He knew his job was to reveal the Messiah. So when the Ju- Judean religious leaders asked, are you the Christ? John's immediate response is this. I am not the Christ or the anointed one. I am not he. I am not the Christ. And John already knew what they were looking for. So then their next question, are you Elijah? 
What is this reference to Elijah? Why would they ask if he was Elijah? Elijah had been carried away, and why would Elijah return? Well, Malachi 4, 5 is the prophecy about the forerunner of the one who would come before Messiah. It says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord, uh, as the day of the Lord comes. So they say, are you Elijah? Are you the forerunner? Are you, are you Elijah reincarnated? Are you Elijah who has come back, sent, sent back from God? And John says, I am not. Well, what about the prophet? What is, what is that phrase, the prophet? Remember, a lot of these things are just hyperlinks back to what the Jews of the day would have already known about. So this is why there's not a lot of explanation because everyone hearing or reading this in that day would have had knowledge of what these things meant. So we study it out to understand. What does it mean by the prophet? Deuteronomy eighteen fifteen, God said, I will raise up a prophet from the midst of thee, a brother like unto Moses. This is what Moses says about himself, that the Lord is saying to his people. So they're saying, are you the one like Moses? Are you the prophet that's come to reveal the Messiah? And he says, I'm not the prophet either. I mean, they're giving John the chance to toot his own horn. And he says, I am not. The thing about John the Baptist, he's he's so consumed with his purpose and the role that he's supposed to play, he refuses any titles. He, he doesn't want anything to distract from his greater purpose. In fact, you will see this in, in later chapters. In John chapter 3, he says, he must become greater, meaning Jesus, and I must become less. This is the heart of John the Baptist. He says, I don't want any titles. I don't know that I'm any of those things. I just know that I'm supposed to do what I'm supposed to do. And here's a phrase that I think we can learn from John the Baptist. I am not. Say that with me. I am not. Say it again. I am not. I think we should learn to say this more to ourselves. I think sometimes in trying to discover our purpose in life... We need to start by understanding who we are not. (laughs) I am not the Christ. I can't save myself. There's a humility that John the Baptist carries when he says, I am not. He refuses any attachments that would elevate him and maybe overshadow the message that he'd come to preach. He says, I am not. I, I love how John the Apostle is writing Because he's taking the I am not statements of John the Baptist. And we'll see in the rest of John, Jesus has seven I am statements about himself. So John loves these contrasts. Like when we started the book, he's talking about light and darkness. Like the Apostle John loves to play these contrasts. And we'll see that play out through the rest of the book. But here he's already setting up this idea that John is saying, I am not... And he is now going to reference Jesus as the I am. If you understand that phrase, I am, we find it in the book of Exodus when, G, uh, when God reveals himself to Moses as the great I am. He says, uh, God says to Moses, you're going to go into Egypt and you're going to bring my people out. And Moses says, well, who am I supposed to say sent me? And God says, this is a self-disclosure of his name. He says, tell them I am sent you. I am Self-existent one. And Jesus himself would claim that same title, I am. We'll see that later in the later chapter. So the fact check is this. John says, I am not, but I know I am is coming. I am not, but I know the I am is coming. And I believe for each one of us that if you know that you are not, is a good place to start to know Jesus, the I am. Things like that Jesus says, deny yourself and take up your cross. Know who you're not so that you might know him. Paul the apostle says, I wanna know Christ. That's the only thing I wanna gain. I wanna lose everything else in life that I might know Jesus. In fact, he goes on to say, everything else in my life that, that could be considered a gain, I consider a loss. I consider it rubbish. I like that word, rubbish. Say rubbish. 
I think you have to say it with like a British accent, though, rubbish. <laughs> in, in English, it would be garbage. All the things that could count as something I could hold to esteem myself, he says, I don't want any of those things. And I think the Apostle John, knowing some of the writings of Paul, captures that when he's pointing out what John the Baptist says, I am not. Our purpose is revealed in the revelation of Jesus. So John tells us who he's not, and then he tells us who he is. They ask, why are you baptizing? If you're not the Christ, if you're not Elijah, if you're not the prophet, why in the world are you baptizing? And what does he say? I'm just the voice. I'm just a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the path. I'm just a voice. Isaiah 43 says of this voice, cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. I'm just a voice. So who is he? He says, I am none of those things. I'm none of those things that you claim. I'm just the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, as the prophet Isaiah said. John the Baptist, if you know anything about the baptisms that were being performed that day, many of the baptisms that would be performed are one of two things. A Gentile, someone who's not Jewish, is converting to become a Jew, and there would be a, an immersion, that's the word baptiz- baptism, baptizo, to immerse, or more likely the daily baptisms that occurred for ritual cleansing so they could go into the area of the temple and, and present their offerings and their sacrifices. They would dip in what's called a mikvah. If you go to Israel with me, when we finally get there, if COVID would ever let us go, uh, when we get there, you'll see these places where you walk in and you immerse yourself and then you walk out and it's this ritual cleansing really for the flesh. It has nothing to do with, with forgiving sin. It's a, it's, a, it's a physical ritual to be allowed into the temple areas. And these were common, but John, what John was doing was different because he wasn't converting anybody. It was, in fact, it was mostly Jews who were crossing over to the other side of the Jordan to be baptized for repentance. This was John's baptism. It was a baptism, not for conversion, but for repentance. And in John's baptism, this is what caught the, the, uh, the eye of the religious leaders, is there's an authority that he has, but that he denies. If he's baptizing people, and people are saying, I have John's baptism, there's an authority that goes with it. But John says, no, 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 no. This isn't the end of something. This is the beginning of something. I am not the final say for the forgiveness of sins, he says, he says, that's for the one who comes after me. I'm just the start. I'm just the forerunner. I'm just the opening act. But he is leading people into this preparation. This is what he says when he says in verse 23, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. If you read that prophecy in Isaiah which we just did, it goes on to say in verse four, every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rugged land a plain and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all humanity together will see it. So when John just gives the opening verse of that passage, the people of that day are literate enough. They've been educated enough. They know the rest of that verse. And what John is saying is that this repentance, this baptism in repentance is about humility. That he's, when he says, I'm making straight the path of the Lord, he's not actually clearing mountains, right? He doesn't have a bulldozer. It's an idiom. And the idiom in the Jewish culture is, is about mountains being obstacles. And what greater obstacle for the coming of the Lord than the unrepentant, sinful heart of humanity? Make sense? So John is inviting people into a humility that allows the entrance of the Lord into this world, making every obstacle low. And it says, making every valley raised up. This is the purpose that John has. 
to prepare the people to receive the Christ, who is Jesus. The human heart is the greatest obstacle that needs to be lowered. And you, you would see in this prophecy this, the kingdom of heaven principle of inversion, right? The first will be last, Jesus would say. The, and the last will be first. The, I will uh, exalt the, the humble and I will humble the, those who exalt themselves. The, the greatest must become the servant, right? This is the inversion of the kingdom of heaven. And John taps into that and says, look, if, if you think you're up here, you're gonna get lowered. Either you do it or, or God himself will do it. And if you're humble, God will raise you up. This is, this is what John is saying. And he would preach that the kingdom of heaven is near and this is how we access the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a circumlocution for the name of God. They didn't wanna keep saying the name of God because there's a high respect for it. So they call it the kingdom of heaven, but it's the kingdom of God. And this is, this is what John would come preaching in the other gospels, that the kingdom of heaven is so close you can literally touch it because it's in the person of Jesus. And he would go on to say, among you stands one you do not know. He's referring to Jesus. That at this point, the Christ was still hidden. Nobody knew that Jesus was the Messiah. But John is about to tell them. But at this point, he's hidden. If you, if you understand what John is saying, he literally did not know his cousin Jesus would be the Messiah he was preparing the way for. And yet, in his humility, John becomes the revelator of who Jesus is. So let's pick it up in verse 29. It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from, he from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John tells us who he's not. John tells us who he is. I, I'm just the voice. I'm just preparing the way. And then he reveals who Jesus is. John tells us who Jesus is. I love how John does this. As he, John, John the Apostle You'll see if you read on through the, the next paragraphs. He begins several of these next paragraphs, seven paragraphs, with this phrase, the next day. It's important to understand that it's, it's not important to John if it's literally the next day. He's drawing you along in the purpose of his writings. He's not concerned with, with, with timeline. He's not caught up in sequence because his sequence will be different than the other gospels who might be actually recording the timeline. It might give you different, but John just brings you on the next day, the next day. Look in your Bible, just scroll through the paragraphs. The next day, the next day, the next day. Is it literally happening every day something? That's not the point of John's writing. He's not bringing you along a timeline. He's bringing you into the revelation of who Jesus is. That's his goal. He's not giving us a sequence. And he mentions this, the baptism of Jesus but why doesn't he explain that Jesus is being baptized, that he actually baptizes Jesus? Because John the Baptist is not claiming any fame from this moment that he baptizes Jesus. If you look in the other gospels, there's the story. So John the apostle doesn't feel like he has to explain it because it's in the other known gospels at this time. Remember, this book was probably written about 60 years after the other gospels. John the Baptist doesn't use it as a way to say, well, look, I'm the guy who actually baptized him. I don't want to brag or anything, but I'm the guy who, who, who did that. John doesn't want that fame, John the Baptist. And so he says, this is who was before me. Do you remember last week we talked about this phrase? What does John the Baptist mean by he was before me and he ranks before me? It, Jesus is actually younger than 
John the Baptist by six months. But he's speaking of Jesus from eternity. The testimony is that after John baptizes Jesus, the spirit of God descends on him and John goes, that's the one. That's the one. John introduces us to this phrase, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Have you heard that phrase before? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The most likely reference is the daily burnt offering of a lamb. And that sacrifice was considered a a sin offering. A sin offering for atonement, the covering of our sin. Uh, in, In some theologies, it's to cover iniquity or wash away the sins of the people. This was offered daily. And for every Jew listening, and probably John the Baptist reference was the Old Testament reference to Abraham and Isaac in Genesis chapter 2, where Isaac becomes the willing sacrifice as his father Abraham takes him up on the top of the mountain according to God's instructions willing to sacrifice his own son, and Isaac being willing to be that sacrifice. If you know the end of the story, Abraham does not sacrifice his son. But there's a a critical question in that story that every hearer would have been drawn to in that moment from their teachings as a kid. You would call it their Sunday school. The question was Isaac's question to his father. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham responds, God himself, will, God himself will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Every hearer would have thought of Isaac in this moment, who willingly let himself be bound to be the, the sacrificial offering in that moment. And the promise that came through the words of Abraham, God himself will provide for himself. Isn't that an interesting phrase? That what God requires for the covering of sin and for sacrifice, he's willing to pay of himself. That's deep theology, folks. (laughs) That God himself will provide this lamb of God. Jesus is that same willing sacrifice. And so John says, I myself did not recognize him. The word in in our translation says, I did not know him. Wasn't that John didn't know Jesus because clearly they knew each other. They're cousins. They live in close proximity to each other. John's statement was one of recognition. I did not recognize him yet as the one. He's speaking of the one that he referred to early as the hidden one. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me, this reference to his, his purpose, God sent me to baptize with water. He said, he told me, God said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, reference to Jesus. And it wasn't until that moment where John baptizes Jesus and the other gospels say it, the spirit descended on on him like a dove and rested upon him. And John goes, oh, that, that's it. That's the one. That's the one I've been waiting for. That's the one who I, and it's my cousin. What? I didn't know that. And John makes this proclamation at the end of this passage. And I have seen And I bear witness, I testify that he is the son of God. There's no hiding it now. Everything in this prologue up until this moment has been sort of figurative and it's been maybe confusing. But here John declares, John the Baptist declares, Jesus is the son of God. That's a pretty bold statement. He's not a good teacher. He's not a prophet. He's nothing like that. He is the son of God. And what we see in John, John was ready to forsake every title that was bestowed on him. Aren't you this? Aren't you that? No, I am not. Every title 
because he only wanted to cling to the privilege of being called a voice of one who made straight the path for the king to come, for the revelation of Jesus. And church, I believe if we take to heart what John the Baptist says, we will find our purpose revealed in the revelation of who Jesus is. I, I used to, as a youth pastor, think this, this identity crisis was only for young people. That middle schoolers and high schoolers or college kids, that, that they're the ones really trying to find their purpose. And that all of us who are in the prime of life, we've got it all figured out. But the longer I've been a lead pastor, the more I realize that there are people in their 30s and 40s and even later in their life, in their 60s and 70s, still trying to figure out their purpose. And can I implore you, church, to understand what John the Baptist understood. He understood who he was not. Until you understand that, I don't know that you'll ever find the purpose in life. To understand that there is someone greater than you. His name is Jesus. And John understood that. And when he understood who he was not, he could step into who he was, who God had called him to be. Just a voice. Just one trying to make straight the path for Jesus. And then John was able to tell others who Jesus was. And I wonder if that, for you and me, if we walked into that this morning, knowing who we're not, to step into who we are so that we might help reveal Jesus to others. Maybe you need to do some fact-checking this morning for yourself. Fact-check, who are you? How many, how many things do we believe about ourselves that aren't true? Good things that we believe too much of or we believe negatively things that aren't really true about us, right? Let's not raise hands, but how many of you have a shame story that you tell yourself over and over again? I'm not good enough. God can't love me. I've gone too far and done too much. Well, you're not the savior, so you don't get to decide that. You don't get to decide who God can save and who God can't save. You are not him. Do you need to write that down? I am not God. Write that down. I am not God. You don't get to decide if you're worthy of salvation or not. Only God gets to decide that. But who are you? You are loved. You are chosen. You are purposed by God himself. You are his child, right? How many verses do we need to go back? Maybe 13 verses. To all who received him, to them he gave the right, full legal standing to be called children of God. Fact check yourself. Are you walking in pride I've got this thing. Ah, I, you know, I prayed a prayer once. I'm good to go. <laughs> Maybe this morning your purpose will be revealed to you as Jesus is revealed. As we pray this morning, one of my prayers this week as I was writing this was that through us, like John the Baptist, Jesus would re be revealed to more and more people. That I'm not content with knowing that I'm saved. That I'm never content in just that, but that I, like John the Baptist, would align myself with the greater purpose of God. That the whole world would know who Jesus is. And maybe that's a challenge for you this morning. That God would reveal Jesus Christ to other people because of you. Isn't that a good prayer? Isn't that a good prayer, church? Amen. That God would re reveal who Jesus is to other people because of the way I'm living my life. 
and the way you're living your life. I really do believe that through us, God reveals Jesus to the world. And in that, you will find your purpose. You will find your identity. All wrapped up in the revelation of who Jesus is. Apart from, from that, your identity fades. So many clamor for what the world says is identity. And you've got to figure this out and this out and this out. But if you start with Jesus, all that will fall into its rightful place. Let's pray this morning, church. Let's pray that we, that the truth about who we are is revealed to us because of God's kindness to us. We understand who we are because of the truth of Jesus and how much he loves us. That we might walk in that purpose and identity, that we might become those who reveal God to all those around us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we make ourselves available to you. First, to strip away all of the identities that we've put on that the world has, has given us, our culture has given to us. To understand who we are not. We are not you. And we are not the things that the world says. But let us be defined by who you say we are as your children and who Christ is and revealed in us. And finally, that we might reveal Jesus to the world. May we be that church who walks in that truth, that our community knows who Jesus is because he lives in us, because of the love and the grace and the truth that flows through us. Lord, let every person within the sound of my voice this morning walk in that purpose, discover that purpose that's grounded in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you're faithful to that, that we each have that call and that purpose, that we have been given that by you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.